So our final lesson, lesson 18, is on batteries. I already mentioned batteries briefly in the previous um, PowerPoint. Let's take a closer look. Batteries. So we'll start with the introduction to batteries from the previous um, um, previous slideshow. Uh, next is static electricity. Chemical batteries are one of the earliest methods used to generate electricity. So we started initially, the history lesson was friction, and then it was the chemical reactions that could create um, EMF or a potential for us. So batteries provide a method of storing an electrical charge as a suspended chemical reaction. So we put the appropriate um, materials in place and and we provide the opportunity for a chemical reaction and once we actually use the battery that chemical reaction is what then creates the voltage for us these are in the wrong order sorry the first known experiments with chemical sources uh luigi galvani 1791 followed in 1800 by alessandro volta uh, resulted in the creation of the first practical battery Okay, so those are two names um, that you may have heard of before. Volta, um, obviously that's where we get the term volt, is from his work. Uh, his original battery consisted of stacking zinc and silver discs with a layer of salt water soaked cardboard in between. We will see an image of that in a few slides. Okay, so um, that's kind of where we began. We'll fast forward here fairly quickly. There it is. Okay, so we take a whole bunch of zinc and silver plates separated by uh, cardboard, which is soaked in salt water. And, and what happens is chemical reactions take place, the interaction of these two dissimilar metals, and we end up recognizing a potential as a result of stacking all of these cells together. In terms of terminology, we're going to see this, but cells are just a part of the larger battery, okay? Let's break this down a little bit more. So a single cell in its simplest form um, is two plates of dissimilar materials with some kind of acidic alkaline or salt solution in between them. Um, something in between these two dissimilar materials which is going to allow for the transfer of electrons, okay? So as, as a chemical reaction takes place and energy um, is released and electrons are forced in a particular direction. Uh, this, um, this solution in between offers the ability for those electrons to move. So the acid, alkaline, or salt solution between the two plates is referred to as an electrolyte. Okay, so this electrolyte provides the ability for uh, electrons to move from one of the plates to the other. Okay, so the two plates are referred to as the electrodes. Okay, and these two electrodes will become positive and negatively charged. And so a negatively or a ch positively charged electrode, we would label as an anode or a cathode. Now, here's where things get a little bit um, uncomfortable. Okay, let's just move on and take a look at this. So the thing about anodes and cathodes is which one is the positive terminal and which one is the negative terminal. And I'll be honest with you, the harder I think about this, the more confused I become. So let me start by saying this is not a test question. Is the cathode the, ant, the, is the cathode the positive terminal or is the cathode the negative terminal? I'm not going to ask you that because the answer is both. Okay. These two points right here really are the two things that, that everybody can agree on at all times. Okay. And that is that electrons flow into the anode and electrons flow out of the cathode. Okay, so, so those two pieces of information really are all we're going to take away from this. Okay, but let me draw a simple circuit for you just to explain the source of the confusion. So let's draw right here. So here is our uh, DC power supply, and here is our circuit. And so here is our resistive load, and here we complete the circuit. Okay, so this is negative, and this is positive. Okay, now we all have decided that the electron flow theory is the correct flow theory, which means that current flows from negative to positive that way. Okay. So that means that um, electrons are exiting the negative terminal. 
Okay, and based on the two points here, electrons flow out of the cathode. So that makes the negative terminal the cathode. All right, and then current flows around our circuit and enters the positive terminal. And so electrons flow into the anode. That makes the anode the positive terminal, right? Well, wait a minute. What if we look at this from the perspective of the battery? Because that's what this lesson is all about. This lesson is looking at the battery itself. So in the battery, and we've had this conversation, that the electrons flow from negative to positive through the circuit. But in the battery, current actually flows, electrons flow from positive to negative. That's what the chemical reaction is doing, is it's pushing the electrons in a particular direction. So this negative terminal, which is where all the electrons are getting pushed to, means that that negative terminal is the anode, the first bullet. Electrons flow into the anode. Okay, so whether the negative terminal is the anode or whether the negative terminal is the cathode is a matter of perspective. Are we looking at the power supply as the source of current flow for our circuit? Or are we looking at what's actually happening inside that DC power supply that gives it its voltage? Okay, so the image that's in this picture, uh, I struggle with. But if we look at this picture here, okay, we can see that that this little this little bowl of, of electrolyte with the anode and the cathode is the power supply feeding the light bulb. And so if we look at it from that perspective, the electrons must be flowing. The, the chemical reaction is pushing the electrons in that direction, which is why this is labeled the anode, because the anode, as the first bullet up here tells us, electrons flow into the anode. So if we're looking at our chemical solution and our chemical reaction, and we're looking at the power source and what is it that causes that power source to have a potential, the anode is the negative terminal. But convention has probably taught you, okay, if, if this is a conversation that you've had before, you probably have, have decided that the cathode is the negative terminal. And I just told you that the anode is the negative terminal. So anybody else confused yet? Like I said, the harder I think about this, the more confused I seem to become. So let's move on with the conversation. There it is, um, anode and cathode. The terms can almost be interchangeable, really depending on what it is you're talking about and your perspective. So, so that's, now that I've got you completely confused, let's just move on. We're just going to leave it at that. Okay. I want you to know these terms and that they exist. Okay. But, but if you ever find yourself confused, the reason is either term can be applied to either terminal, um, depending on the situation. So enough said, let's move on. Wow. So here we go. Here, here's a cell. We've got a, we've got a jar. We've got some kind of electrolyte in the jar. In this particular case, it says it's water and hydrochloric acid. And we have two electrodes that we've placed in it, two different materials, copper and zinc. Okay. And as a result, what's going to happen is we're going to have a movement of electrons and a potential if we were to measure the voltage from the copper plate to the zinc plate. Okay. There it is, a battery in its simplest form. It's called a cell as opposed to a battery because it's just a single copper plate and zinc plate in our hydrochloric acid. Okay, so that's that's what a cell is. Okay, here's another example of a cell. Sorry, some simple cells created from science experiments include zinc and iron in a lemon aluminum. Sorry. Zinc and iron in a lemon, that's one example. Aluminum and copper in a potato. And a penny and a nickel sandwiched with saliva soaked paper in between. And that's what the picture is here. This is what I was expecting initially. So this is a very simple little cell, a copper and a nickel. And the paper, if the paper is dry, then it doesn't assist in the transfer of electrons, which is why it's saliva soaked. So if this paper is, and, and our saliva, of course, is full of salt. And so um, that paper now will assist in the transfer of electrons from one of the metals to the other, the two dissimilar metals. And we can put a, 
it would have to be a very sensitive voltmeter, but a voltmeter would recognize a potential in that very simple little cell. Okay, so that's something that we can build and experiment on in a really simple fashion. Okay. Now, in terms of what kind of metals, what kind of materials we need, this this is a, a list of some of the examples. Okay, so so you can see that it's a pretty long list and all kinds of stuff here. Uh, you will notice um, if you think about names of types of batteries. Okay, you will notice some familiar uh, terms here. Okay, cadmium is one that I want to that I want to recognize. Everybody is probably um, familiar with the nickel cadmium battery, and so you see both nickel and cadmium on that list. Okay, so just for example, notice there's also gold on the list. Okay, we tend not to use gold to create batteries; far too expensive, but it works very nicely. Okay, let's move on. The voltage potential that a cell will produce is directly related to the materials used. So remember, uh, this is all about the chemical reaction and the chemical reactions and the amount of energy uh, generated by those chemical reactions depends entirely on the materials that we're using in our chemistry. Okay. So here's an example and it's very specific and they all are an alkaline battery which uses zinc and manganese dioxide as its two electrodes um, with a potassium hydroxide electrolyte will result in a production of one and a half volts of potential. Okay, so that's, that's completely a result of the chemistry, all right, and it will always be that way, all right, initially until the chemical reaction is spent and then we will see a reduction in the voltage generated and it's time to throw the battery and get a new one. OK, but a, a an alkaline battery will always result in the production of sorry, an alkaline cell. OK, that term battery probably is inappropriate on this slide. We're still talking about just a single cell will produce one and a half volts. Now, there's two different types of cells, and I, I mentioned this um, previously in the in the other PowerPoint when I was talking about different ways of producing EMF. I didn't use the term primary and secondary, however. Okay, two different types of cells. Primary and secondary are the labels. What's the difference? A primary cell is one that uses a combination of materials that cannot readily be recharged once they've been used, which means the chemical reaction naturally happens in a particular direction, okay, producing a voltage, producing a potential, producing EMF, okay, but we cannot drive that chemical reaction in the opposite direction. Okay, and so once the battery has been used, once the cell has been used, it done, throw it out, get a new one. Some examples of primary cells, carbon zinc, alkaline, so there's a term I expect many of you are familiar with, you've heard of alkaline batteries, mercury, silver zinc, and zinc air, okay? Secondary, on the other hand, a secondary cell means that we can drive the reaction in the opposite direction. Okay, so the chemical reaction naturally happens in one direction, releasing energy, creating our voltage, but then we can apply energy to that particular cell and drive the chemical reaction back in the other direction so that we can allow it to react again and create voltage again. Okay, so it can be repeatedly charged and discharged. Okay, some examples here, lead acid. Okay, lead acid battery, that is your car battery. Okay, recharges every time your car is running. Nickel iron, nickel cadmium, and lithium ion. Probably terms you've heard uh, somewhere along the way talking about batteries. Okay, secondary cells, the ability to recharge. Here's an example of a whole bunch of different cells, primary cells, secondary cells, and we can see um, the different combinations that can be put together and the volts as a result. Okay, so your typical alkaline battery has a negative plate. Notice they don't use the term anode or cathode here, they just say negative plate. 
okay so from the perspective of a cell this is the anode this is the plate that the electrons are being pushed towards okay from the perspective of the circuit when we use this battery we would probably call the negative terminal the cathode because now in the circuit that's the um see i'm getting myself confused um but the terminology gets flipped right so that's why this particular table doesn't call this the anode or cathode just says this is the negative plate okay made up of zinc and you can see that all of these primary cells use zinc as the negative plate and this particular alkaline battery uses manganese dioxide as the positive plate and potassium hydroxide as the electrolyte and the resulting output of that cell is one and a half volts okay so we can see there's a number of different combinations lift, listed here and we can see that we get different voltages output as a result okay now again my image is in the way so we can't see the bottom right but here are our secondary cells so first listed is the lead acid that's your car battery and then we have nickel iron nickel cadmium silver zinc silver cadmium uh, tells you the different combinations this particular this list is not test material i'm not going to be asking you for specifics how do you make you know a lead acid cell okay but just to give us an idea notice that the output of a lead acid cell is 2.2 volts okay typically we consider that to be two volts all right so if you have a six cell battery that offers you 12 volts it's actually it's 13 plus okay um and if your car actually has a gauge that tells you the voltage of your battery okay actually uses numbers you will see that even though it's a 12 volt battery you're typically up in the neighborhood of 13 volts uh, output from that battery and that's because each of those six cells okay produces 2.2 volts okay um and the voltage outputs of these other uh, items unfortunately we can't see them around my face either but if you have printed off the powerpoints from uh, blackboard then you you've got those numbers in front of you i can't even see them from my vantage point right now so let's move on that's just to give you some perspective about what we're talking about here the electrolytic material we can break batteries up into two categories here as well we have dry cell batteries and we have wet cell batteries and those labels are assigned to batteries entirely based on um, the electrolyte that is used okay so dry cells have a dry electrolyte and carbon zinc and alkaline batteries are examples of dry cell batteries wet cell again here this is definitely going to be your car battery okay we know that um the lead acid battery has as has acid in it okay sometimes although i don't think we'd ever do it anymore but it used to be standard that you would have to uh top up your cells in your in your car battery okay because they are wet cells okay so what is a battery then as opposed to a cell okay a battery is a collection of cells all right i've already been talking about this the six cell car battery is exactly that it's a battery because it is made up of six separate individual cells okay the term battery and cell they they tend to get thrown around interchangeably but specifically that's what that's what the difference is okay a battery is simply a collection of cells okay so a single dry cell used in a flashlight is often called a battery okay but it's not it's only a cell in reality a flashlight has more than one dry cell connected together only then is it called a battery okay so battery and cell car batteries consist of six two volt cells giving you 12 volts okay so let's talk a little bit about capacity rating there's all kinds of different ways that we can we can apply numbers and values and quantities to the capacity of a battery we're not going to cover all of them we're just we're going to look at this fairly quickly but in addition to just identifying the voltage output of a battery we also have to talk about its capacity and the term that we typically use is an amp hour rating okay so the amp hour rating uh, in its simplest terms amp hour rating 
is the number of amps a battery is able to provide for one hour. Okay, so if the battery goes from fully charged to fully spent in one hour, how many amps can it push? How many electrons can it push during that period of time? Okay, so that's really what an amp hour rating is all about. Okay, it's a number that we can assign to a battery to talk about its current ability. Okay, so I mean, everything is about voltage and current, right? So we, we know the voltage, the voltage output is going to be what it is based on the chemical composition of that cell and that collection of cells. Okay, but then we want to know about the current. All right, and so the current is, is articulated in an amp hour rating. Okay, uh, so typically we can't expect a battery to go from fully charged to fully discharged in one hour. That's not really realistic. Most batteries are designed uh, for the chemical reaction to occur much slower and then extend it over a much longer period of time. Okay, so realistically, amp hour is kind of artificial. All right, but it is a way in which we can equalize and normalize all of our cells and all of our batteries in a way that we can compare them meaningfully. So now that we've done that, we can move on to connecting multiple batteries together to give us a battery bank. Okay, so in most of your cars, you only have a single battery, but if you have a larger truck, uh, you might have a couple of batteries. Okay, certainly um, in, in our solar farms, um, we have large battery banks. Okay, there are all kinds of different applications where, where, where large battery banks are required. So how do we connect our batteries? Well, anytime we connect anything electrically, we have two choices, right? Parallel or series. So what's the result of connecting multiple batteries together in either parallel or series? Okay, batteries connected in series, what happens? Batteries connected in series will provide an increase in voltage, but with the same amp hour rating as a single battery. So the good news is that this is information we already know. All right, in a series circuit, what's constant? Well, current is constant. Doesn't matter where you measure current through a series circuit, you get the same answer. And so the amp hour rating of a battery is the equivalent of the amount of current that it can push. And therefore, when we connect multiple batteries in series, that current, or in this case, the amp hour rating, which is its battery equivalent, remains constant. Well, what about the voltage in a series circuit? Well, the voltage gets shared, right? So if we're talking about loads, its voltage drops. If we're talking about power supplies, in this case, batteries, we're talking about voltage rises. And when we add multiple batteries together in series, we add up all of those voltage rises. Okay, so an increase in voltage, but a constant amp hour rating is the result of connecting batteries in series. So here we go. We, we have four uh, identical batteries. They are 12 volt batteries, 12 volt output, and, and a rating of 60 amp hours. So if we connect these four batteries together in series, the result of that battery bank is 48 volts. So we just add up the 12 volts, 12 times four equals 48. And the amp hour rating remains constant. Okay. The other thing we can look at here is how do we connect batteries in series? And we connect our positive and negatives together from one to the next. Okay. So, so from this negative terminal of this battery, we connect to the positive terminal of the next battery. And from the negative terminal of that battery, we connect to the positive terminal of the next battery, and so on and so forth down the line. Okay. Taking it away from this artificial image to something that looks more realistic, here's how that looks like in an actual battery bank. Okay. So in this case, we have four batteries. They are 12 volt batteries with 100 amp hours. The end result of placing the four of these in series. And the image showing us how we accomplish that gives us a battery bank with an output of 48 volts at 100 amp hours. What if we connect them in parallel? Can we guess how this is going to turn out? Batteries connected in parallel, parallel will provide the same voltage as any single battery in the battery bank, but with an increase in the amp hour rating. 
Okay, so now in a parallel circuit, every parallel branch gets the same voltage. And so when we place multiple voltage rises together in parallel, we don't add them up. The output is the same yet again, but now we increase the current. Okay, so the amp hour rating gets increased, gets added up as a result of all of these batteries connected in parallel. So now the image kind of almost starts to get a little messy on us. Okay, but the end result, we've placed the same four batteries, 12 volt batteries, 60 amp hours, uh, we place them together now in parallel, and the output of that battery bank is 12 volts. But we increase the amp hour rating, we're adding them all up. So Kirchhoff's current law, these four batteries are sharing the load. All right, whatever whatever the resistive load happens to be so we've got the resistor out here or maybe we have a whole bunch of them okay and whatever that load happens to be whatever that current is whatever the demand is from the power supply gets shared okay so that full current is coming in on this wire and a fourth of it goes there and carries on a fourth of it goes there and it carries on and one fourth goes there and the final quarter of that total current goes there and so the four batteries share the current load of the circuit and therefore it lasts four times as long okay so so the voltage output is the same but our amp hour rating okay the the ability for those batteries to continue to provide power um, gets uh, increased by a factor of four because there are four batteries because the four batteries are sharing the current okay so what does that look like if we replace this drawing with a picture of actual batteries this time we've only got three of them but here we are and and this one uh, even though the previous drawing looked a little bit confusing, the actual process of hooking this up is really easy. All right, we just connect all the positive terminals together, we connect all the negative terminals together, and we're done. Okay, nice and easy. So in this case, what are we looking at? So we've got 12 volt batteries at 100 amp hours. Okay, so the output is still the same 12 volts, but we have three batteries at 100 amp hours each, means the capacity of our of our of our bank of batteries is the total 300 amp hours okay so one last thought where can we go from here well if we can connect batteries in series and we can connect batteries in parallel if we have more than two of them we can put them together and we end up with effectively a combination circuit so we combine batteries in series and parallel combining batteries in series and parallel can provide both an increase in voltage and an increase in the amp hour rating and here's an example okay so still the same four batteries in, in each of our our drawings right 12 volts 60 amp hours all right now we have a we have two 12 volt batteries connected in series okay and so together they will offer 24 volts all right Likewise, down here, 12 volts plus 12 volts connected in series gives us 24 volts. Okay, so we have two branches at 24 volts each connected in parallel, giving us a total output of that same 24 volts. Okay, but now this 60 amp hours and this 60 amp hours connected in series don't give us any increase. That's constant. But we also have 60 amp hours here connected in series with this 60 amp hours which is also constant but because we have 60 amp hours connected in parallel with another 60 amp hours we get 120 amp hours output so series circuits parallel circuits combination circuits all right the the power supplies follow the very same rules as the loads and so everything that we learned all of that work we did in the first half of this course we can apply that knowledge and understanding to our batteries and figure out how to hook up batteries to create battery banks to give us 
a variety of voltage um, outputs and capacities. Okay, and that concludes it right there, guys. That is all I have left to say. Okay, I'm going to leave all of this material available to you uh, when I give you your test next week. Um, so it's going to be a PDF for you to print off and work your way through. Uh, my recommendation is don't study and then do the test print off the test, go through it question by question, refer to my material, come back and watch these videos repeatedly, uh, work your way through it in a, in a slow and methodical fashion. Um, treat it like the take home test that it is. It's been a pleasure hanging out with you guys. Uh, I hope this wasn't too clumsy. I know I, it felt like it didn't always work as well as it should have, but uh, I think we got through it and hopefully we get a chance to spend more time together next year. And if there are blanks I need to fill in, I hope I get the chance to do that. Okay. Good luck, guys. And hopefully we are in touch again.